I'm Brad Neal. This is Chem 150. Let's talk about intermolecular forces. So um, intermolecular forces are important because of what they do for us. They help us understand uh, the properties of solids, liquids, and gases better. Um, whoops, and we are on the totally wrong slide. There we go. So what are the properties of solids, liquids, and gases? We talked about this at the beginning of the semester, um, but it isn't a bad thing to go back and review. So on the left in this first table, we've got various phases of water. So steam, liquid water, and ice. So gas, liquid, solid. Um, there's different temperatures. And we can see just by the different phase of matter that water is in, we have really different densities. Um, as a gas, the density is incredibly low. As a liquid, the density is reasonable. And then as a solid, it's actually less dense than the liquid. And because it's less dense than the liquid, solid ice floats. Bet you didn't know that ice floats, did you? That's actually kind of unique though. Most of the time when things freeze, um, the solid ends up with a higher density than the liquid. If we get into it later on, um, a thing called hydrogen bonding helps us understand uh, why that is the way it is. Anyways, so in general, uh, if we look at gases, liquids, and solids, we can think about them in terms of their density, their shape, their volume, and this thing that we're going to call intermolecular forces. Now, I always abbreviate it IMF because I'm a Mission Impossible fan, and Mission Impossible uh, is all about the uh, impossible mission force, the IMF. So I just think that's really funny. I don't think a lot of people use IMF, but I do. Because you got to do some things just for you, you know. So the density, like we described with uh, solids, or I'm sorry, with the phases of uh, water, are usually pretty low for a gas, high and high. Now when we mean, sh or when we're talking about shape, we're actually saying, okay, how does the thing have a fixed shape? Um, and so by saying undefined, well, gas is going to fill the and take the shape of whatever container it's in a liquid's going to try to do that um, but a liquid won't be able to do it as well as a gas and a solid a solid's just going to have a different uh, defined shape it's going to be fixed the volume of a gas like we've talked about in our gases chapter well it can expand to fill whatever volume the container it is or it can be compressed uh, whereas with a liquid um, it's going to have a defined volume um, and so will a solid. So these properties of shape and volume are really useful. Um, so if you've ever driven a car before um, and you've pumped on the brakes or you've just hit the brakes, uh, the brakes hopefully have worked for you. Now, one of the ways that, uh, especially if you have a hydraulic brake system, one of the ways that a braking system in a car works is that there's fluid in the brake lines. Because it, the fluid, the liquid, has a defined volume when you push the brake, your pushing causes the fluid to push against and activate the braking system uh, in the vehicle because it has this defined volume. What happened if you put gas in your brake line? Um, and this is what happens when you have a leak in your brake line. Sometimes you'll get gas pockets in there. Well, because a gas has an undefined volume and it can be compressed, so you can actually have, whoops there, you can actually have a situation with your brakes when you're driving your car. Uh, if you've got gas in there, you can compress that gas and it won't actually, the gas won't apply any pressure to the braking system and so your car will just keep on going. Ask me how 17-year-old uh, Brad found out about that when he was driving his truck down a hill. So we're going to talk about intermolecular forces here, but one thing we can look at with density, shape, and volume is this idea of, well, what's happening to the individual particles uh, with respect to their shape, volume, and densities? Because we kind of are seeing some trends here as we go along. And these forces are going to be weak, moderate, and strong for these various states. 
if we want to take a visualization of what's happening in these different states, we have up here at the very top what we can think of as our particles of a gas and how they might look in respect to one another. Now notice all of these things are moving. The top is the gas, the middle is the liquid, and the bottom is the solid. So everything is moving. And that's because all atoms move unless you're at absolute zero. Only at absolute zero does all kinetic motion stop. It's just that when you're a gas, the particles aren't held very closely to one another and they move around quite freely. When you're a liquid, the particles kind of stick to one another, but they can still move and slide around on top of one another like a fluid. And that's why we would say gases and liquids are both fluids. Whereas here as a solid, they're kind of wiggling, but they're wiggling in place, so they're just kind of vibrating back and forth, um, but they're not really sliding over top of one another. So far, so good? Yep. Yep. Pretty straightforward. This is where stuff gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so I like this table. It comes from Wikipedia, um, and it's if you go to uh, any of these, uh, if you look up any of these kinds of bonding on Wikipedia, you're going to see um, at the very bottom of the table, or I'm sorry, the very bottom of the web page, a table that looks like this. The reason that I like this is um, it does, a, in my opinion, a really nice job of delineating um, the kinds of chemical bonds that we have. So over here on the left, we see these things here at the bottom, which we're not going to worry about. We're not going to worry about cleavage or electron counting or um, authority control. We're not worrying. No. What we are going to be looking at is intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. So an intramolecular force is being listed here as strong. Well, this would be a strong chemical bond. These are the what we've talked about up until this point in chemistry. These are our covalent bonds, and there are our, our ionic bonds and our metallic bonds. So these are the interactions uh, within a substance. So in the case of our ionic, we've got columbic interactions. In the case of our covalent, we've got our sharing of electrons. These intramolecular forces are incredibly strong. And these are the things that hap that are occurring within a one molecule, within one molecule. This other classification down here, this intermolecular, these intermolecular forces are really weak comparatively. That isn't to say they're not important, but they're really weak comparatively. This is gonna be the focus of th this chapter. Up to this point, we've been talking mostly about chemical properties with respect to intramolecular bonding. Now we're going to be talking about intermolecular forces. And if you remember your prefix lesson from high school, I'm assuming they still do prefix lessons in high schools, um, the difference between intra and inter is with intra, it's within, so within the molecule bonding, versus inter, which is inter is between molecules. So for an for us to have an intermolecular force, we or an intermolecular bond, you might call it, um, we have to have two or more molecules. These are going to be the interactions that molecules have within one another and are going to help us explain why gases are gases, why liquids are liquids, and why solids are solids. Now there's a whole bevy of these intermolecular forces, but we're only going to focus on a fistful of them, namely what we're going to call London dispersion forces, sometimes just called dispersion forces or van der Waals interactions, dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonds, ion dipoles. So these are the ones that your book goes over. Um, believe me when I say there's more classifications that we could go over if we chose to, but this is what your book goes over. This is what we're going to talk about. London dispersion forces. Okay. Key fact about these kinds of forces, every single atom and molecule in existence can have London dispersion forces. That doesn't mean that you're going to be able to observe the London dispersion forces, but it means that they can exist. 
it's really important, especially when it comes to atoms. Um, atom, this is the major kind of force that will hold atoms of things together. Now, these come, up, come around because of the creation of an instantaneous dipole moment uh, around a species that is nonpolar. So we're going to have a nonpolar atom because atoms are pretty much by definition nonpolar, or we're going to have a nonpolar molecule. And if you don't remember what polarity is, I highly recommend you go back and you check out the, um, some of the previous videos that we've done about polarity and going through that simulation about uh, dipole moments. We have to start with something that's nonpolar for us to observe a London dispersion force. These things are dumb weak. This is our weakest of our intermolecular force. Um, and we've got some data to help illustrate that here in a second. Okay, so let's talk about why these things work. Let's take the example here on the left first. So we've got helium atom A, we've got helium atom B. They're atoms, they're not polarized, right? They're a nonpolar atom by definition. The electrons are just floating around and our helium's gonna have two of these electrons floating around. Now, like we talked about with the Vesper, Vesper, the electrons don't want to be next to one another. They're typically going to be apart as much as they can. Sometimes though, those electrons are gonna show up on one side of a molecule or, molecule or an atom more than the other side for an instant. You could say they instantaneously appear on the same side. And when we talked about electrostatic potential maps, this here is pretty much an electrostatic potential map. On one side of our atom of interest, we have a partial negative occurring because we have electrons instantaneously, randomly showing up on one side of the atom and not the other. So one side has a partial negative, so we get the partial negative versus the partial positive. Okay, so this one has an instantaneous dipole moment. This lasts for like a fraction of a second. It's not very long, very long lasting. But because it does exist for a second here, atom B can say, whoa, wait a second, the electrons can say, well, there's this partial positive charge over here. I'm attracted to partial positive charges because I'm a negatively charged particle. So atom B can then form an instantaneous dipole moment. Now, just as fast as these instantaneous dipole moments form, they disappear. They go right back the reverse direction and we go back to having non-polarized atoms. And the majority of the atom's lifespan um, is going to be in this non-polarized state. But because we're going to have this temporary moment where they do exist in this polarized state, they can have just this eensy bitsy attraction between one another. And so they'll stick together just a eensy little bit. But most of the time, they're not going to be attracted. And that helps us understand why helium is a gas, because he gas particles aren't really sticking to one another. Um, they're bouncing around freely. There's nothing to hold these helium particles together. There's no attraction between them. We can do the same thing with molecules, such as like hydrogen here. It works the exact same way. You start out with something that's nonpolar. You instantaneously polarize it by putting a dipole moment, by having the electrons show up on one side of the molecule more than another, bumps into a neighbor. The neighbor then says, hey, I'm gonna interact in a way and boom, you have this interaction and they're held together just for a little bit of a second and then they fly apart. So it's just as soon as they come together and they say like, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm all right, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. They then dispart. That's pretty much how London dispersion forces work. They just instantaneously appear and they instantaneously disappear. Um, so what are some things that we can predict based off of these instantaneous dipole moments. Well, let's take a look here at this class of molecules here, this methane, ethane, propane, and n-butane. All right, all we're doing here is um, adding additional carbons and hydrogens. And so we're making a molecule that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we go from one carbon in methane all the way out to four carbons with butane. And we're adding in an appropriate number of hydrogens to what we call saturate 
the carbons. Um, you can see that the molar mass of these molecules is getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. What's also getting bigger? Well, our boiling point is increasing. We're going from really, really low to, eh, that's about, I mean, it's still pretty cold, but that's actually in the realm of possibility now. So what's happening? Why is this change in boiling point occurring? Well, you got more electrons when you go from methane up to n-butane, right? More atoms. More atoms means more electrons. So what? Well, when, why does it matter that we have more electrons? Because... So what's the big thing that you have to be able to do to, in, to form a London dispersion force? You have to be able to create... Instantaneous dipole moment. Okay, so if you have to be able to create an instantaneous dipole moment, and if you can create an instantaneous dipole moment, then you're usually sticking together closer, or you're sticking together better. Nope. Let me try that again. So if you form an instantaneous dipole moment, they can stick together, right? Yeah. yeah. When you are boiling, it means you're going from the liquid phase to the gas phase. In a liquid phase, we said the molecules kind of are sliding around each other, but they're still sticking next to one another. In a gas phase, they are totally not sticking together at all. Would you say methane has stronger or weaker dipole moment, or I'm sorry, stronger or weaker London dispersion force than compared to butane? Weaker. Weaker. It's got a lower boiling point. So two methane molecules are not hanging out next to each other as strongly as two butane molecules are hanging out next to each other. So what can we do to explain that strength? Well, the strength is based off of how strong this dipole moment is, right? Even if it's an induced dipole moment. This gives us some idea that, yeah, this is a lower boiling point, but it's got a weaker dipole moment than compared to N-butane. Okay. Strictly speaking, these molecules have no dipole moment, but the instantaneous dipole moment that we can form with N-butane is stronger than the instantaneous dipole moment we can make with methane. So why would this instantaneous dipole moment in butane be able to be bigger? than the instantaneous dipole moment in methane. There are more atoms. More atoms leads to more... Electrons. More electrons. And if you can have more electrons bunch up on one side of the molecule compared to the other, you're going to have a greater difference in that partial negative. So one side's going to be partially negative, more partially negative. One side will be more partially positive. And the stronger the partial negative charge, the stronger the interaction you can have with a partial positive charge. The stronger the interaction, the more the molecules want to hang out next to one another. The more the molecules want to hang out next to one another, the higher the boiling point's going to be. So by increasing mass, we increase our electron cloud size. By increasing the electron cloud size, we increase the polarizability of our molecule. The bigger the polarizability of our molecule, the stronger the instantaneous dipole interactions we can have between two of the same molecule. Yep, it comes down to how big your electron cloud is, and then based off of the, how big that electron cloud is, um, the bigger, the more polarizable you can make it. The more polarizable, the stronger the interactions between two of the same kind of molecules bigger the interaction, the higher your boiling point gets. Because by having a higher boiling point, we're saying it takes more and more energy to break the molecules apart from one another to put them into the gas phase. Because going into the gas phase is an endothermic process. So 
another way we can change this is like the example here on the right, and that's surface area. Both these molecules have the exact same molar mass, but one has a much, much bigger boiling point than the other. By increasing the surface area, the molecules can't slide past one another as easily. Um, think about like if you have, um, I'm trying to think, like if you've got, like with this N, or I'm sorry, this dimethyl propane, you can almost think of this thing as being like a baseball shape. It's just a big ball. Whereas the N pentane is more cylindrical, like a pencil or a rod. It's harder to get two rods to slide past one another than it is to get two baseballs to slide past one another. The more surface area you have so that the molecules can interact with one another, the stronger the interactions will typically be and your, the higher your boiling point will be. And that's kind of the way to think about surface area. Increasing surface area will increase boiling point if you hold everything else equal. And everything else here is your molar mass and the atoms that you're using. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dipole, dipole, comparatively, understanding-wise, is a breeze. Because, one, not all molecules can have these. Atoms are not going to have a dipole, dipole interaction, and that's because this comes from the interaction of two polar molecules. You can't have an atom that's going to be a polar molecule just right there in the name of it. Um, now, one thing I would point out is like uh, our induced dipole, induced dipole slash called the London dispersion forces, um, they don't have to be between two of the exact same kind of atom or molecule. In the case of dipole, dipole doesn't have to, and it doesn't have to with the other. Um, it's just typically for most examples that you're going to read, it's going to give you some indication as to are you comparing two of the same molecule to one another. So like when we did this example here, we were saying the boiling point of methane. Well, we just showed you a picture of one single methane molecule. If it helps you conceptualize it better, write out another methane molecule. Um, or another ethane molecule, another propane, another n-butane, and ask yourself, okay, this is it's the through space interaction between those two things that I'm trying to observe right now. What's affecting that through space interaction? And you can do the exact same thing here with dipole-dipole interactions. Um, and that's what I'm saying with it doesn't have to be a molecule A interacting with molecule A always. It can be a molecule A interacting with molecule B. I'll show you some examples of that. Um, these kinds of interactions are fairly weak, but they're stronger than our London dispersion forces, uh, usually by a good bit. So they're still not super strong, but they're stronger. Here's an example of the kinds of interactions that we could think about uh, with respect to two dipole or two polar molecules coming in or coming into contact with one another. We can have a situation where we have a dipole moment or we have a uh, molecule that has a partial positive charge and a partial negative charge. And it kind of comes like inverted, like it sandwiches in that away. Um, so that the partial negative on the one molecule interacts with the partial positive of the other molecule and vice versa. So you could have two interactions between molecules like that. And it's this space between the molecules that is the intermolecular force. Now, nobody said you had to have two molecules interacting exactly like this. In fact, when you do have two molecules interacting like this, they typically uh, won't interact with other molecules as easily. Um, and depending on how strong this kind of interaction is, you might have what's called a dimer getting formed. And a dimer is when two molecules interact with one another with a really strong intermolecular force um, so strongly that they kind of act like just one really big molecule instead of two smaller molecules. You'll get in that in organic chemistry. You could just have these things be end on end with one another. So a partial negative interacts with a partial positive. You could think about this one allowing you a lot of uh, 
chaining. So you could imagine like one big mambo line of molecules just all doing the cha-cha next, you know, down the line with one another, holding on to like the shoulder in front of one of the next molecule. You could also imagine if we don't invert these two things, we have the positive interact with the positive and the negative interact with the negative, we get repulsion. And likewise, if we have these things go butt to butt with one another, we get some repulsion. If you want to get real crazy, um, it's not that crazy, but it's a little crazy. This is like a picture of what you might expect to exist in a fluid. So here we have a bunch of molecules that um, are all polar. It's all the same kind of molecule. But now they're oriented in all these kind of mismatch directions. One of the things that you're going to typically find as a difference between a liquid and a solid is that in the liquid, the molecules are free flowing over top of one another. You're also usually not gonna have that good of long range ordering. So that's to say that you're not gonna have a nice repeating structure of your molecules as you go along. They're gonna be, um, well, something that looks more like this. So you have, in the green arrows, attractions, and you're going to have in the gray arrows, repulsions happening simultaneously. Um, and because the, all these molecules are moving, they're just going to keep on tumbling and you're going to be forming attractions, repulsions, attractions, repulsions. And energetically, at the end of the day, for this to be a liquid, excuse me, at a given temperature, we're saying that the attractions uh, save energy more than the repulsions cost energy. So there's a net energy saving when we have a liquid um, when the energy saving comes in the form of these attractions. And this, so this is something like what you might expect any, any old liquid to look like. So this mismatch web of stuff that happens. Isn't that exciting? It's chaotic. It is chaotic. Yeah. And that's kind of what fluids are. Fluids are, uh, especially liquids. Um, liquids are um, long range disorder. <laughs> Gases are like uh, really long range disorder. Um, they just are kind of off doing their own thing. Like they're so far apart from one another. But with a liquid, the molecules are like, I want to be apart. I want to do my own thing, but I also want to be kind of next to you because I'm kind of attracted to you. But I want to be doing my own thing. Don't hold me down. Because all molecules have personalities like that with some <laughs> accents. So, um, here's a pretty classic question coming from this Libre text, uh, website. They are amazing. Can't give them enough plugs. Um, a ranger ethyl meth, ethyl methyl ester to methyl propane isobutane and acetone in order of increasing boiling points. And here are their structures. Holy cow, right? Like, where do we even begin? Any thoughts? So what we know so far is London dispersion forces are way weaker than dipole-dipole interactions. So the first thing that you want to look at when you see these things is try to classify what kind of intermolecular force will a molecule have, which then is really asking you, will the molecule be polar or is the molecule polar? So let's take the far left, the two methyl propane, this thing over here. Will this molecule be a polar molecule? short answer is going to be no. The reason that we're going to say it's no is when we think back to electronegativity, we'd say, okay, if I've got this central atom right here, we're going to take this carbon in the middle as our central atom for the first moment. Um, a carbon-carbon bond is going to be a nonpolar bond. And the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is so small that we pretty much consider it to be a non-polar, or there to be no dipole moment between the carbon-hydrogen bond. And since this molecule has nothing but carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds, there's not going to be any dipole moments that we're going to write out. If we don't have any dipole moments, this makes this a 
nonpolar molecule. How do you know what each thing is? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so white is hydrogen, black is carbon, and red is oxygen. Oh. Yeah. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Yeah, these are like, and then blue is typically nitrogen, yellow is sulfur. I'm going to give it to you in letters. I'm not going to give you color diagrams like that on an exam or something. But in the bills, the red is oxygen, blue is nitrogen, uh, black is carbon, white is hydrogen, yellow is sulfur. I'm pretty sure it's yellow. Hit me up in the YouTube comments below. So we've got a completely nonpolar molecule over here. So we're going to th think, okay, those intermolecular forces are going to be ridiculously weak. Now, what about our methyl, ethyl, methyl ester and our acetone? Will these be nonpolar or polar molecules? What do you need to know to answer whether it's going to be polar or nonpolar? It's a... Uh... I don't know. Electronegativity. Oh, well, yeah. You got to know what your difference in electronegativity is going to be with these things. So if we take the hydrogen carbon as still being a no difference in electronegativity kind of bond, there's not going to be any difference in electronegativity really out here, around this carbon, around this carbon, except... There is a difference in electronegativity between our oxygen and our carbons. The oxygen is much more electronegative than our carbon is. So we would expect to be able to, be able to draw a bond dipole arrow going from this carbon pointing towards this oxygen, from this carbon pointing towards this oxygen, for an overall dipole moment pointing up this away so if we've got that ethyl mess ethyl methyl ester oops let's not write in highlighter that might be hard we're gonna have c h h h o one pair c c h h h H, H, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to draw a dipole arrow for your, each of our carbon oxygen bonds. That looks kind of like that. For an overall dipole arrow pointing up in that, in that light blue right here is that ringing bells yeah um so we got ourselves an overall polar molecule Because that thing is polar and our methyl propane is not polar, we're going to go ahead and say, hey, this one should probably have a higher boiling point than the other one. Why is it overall polar? It's overall polar because of that green highlighted air area on the um, ethyl methyl ester that we've got drawn out. That overall arrow remaining like that. Um, says overall the molecule has some amount of polarity to it. We're not saying how strong the pol the its polarity is, but we are saying there is some. Okay. Yeah, we haven't given a good indication on the like a numeric value of strength. We we're just saying it exists. It's there. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's go to acetone, the one on the far right. Acetone is C double bond O. And if we draw out the Lewis structures, let 
we get something that looks like that. All those carbon hydrogen bonds don't have any kind of dipole moment, but we have this carbon oxygen double bond. And that carbon oxygen double bond is gonna have a pretty strong overall dipole moment. The oxygen is more electronegative by a good bit, and it's gonna be pointing in the direction that we've got drawn. And the one thing that it has going for it that our molecule above doesn't have going for it is the molecule above this arrow and this arrow. Um, they're kind of counter to one another. So if we do our vector math and we take this one and we draw it out and then we take this one and we start it at the end of the other one. So this was arrow one, this is arrow one, this is arrow two, this is arrow two. Overall, we get a uh, new color. This in the purple. This in the purple is our overall bond dipole moment, or I'm sorry, overall molecular dipole moment that we originally had highlighted in green. I'm confused. What is what is what's happening there? So all the stuff that I just wrote out is just the vector addition of our individual uh, bond dipole moments. So you have to take all of your bond dipole moments, add them all together with this vector addition kind of jazz that I tried to draw out. Once you do that vector addition, the you draw the an arrow like I did in purple, where you go from the start of your first arrow to the end of your last arrow and you say, okay, where was my starting point? Where is my end point? Draw an arrow corresponding to that. That represents the direction and the magnitude of your overall uh, vector that the molecule is feeling with respect to dipole moments. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's vector math, and I'm not... I'm, Still not exactly great at explaining math. So think about it like as a treasure map. So like if you started here and then you went here and then you went here and then you like ended here, right? you could say, well, overall, our only difference in where we started and where we ended is here in the purple or highlighted in green. Like that's the only true uh, difference between our starting and our end position, even though we stopped at all those other little points along the way and we walked all that distance. Does that make sense? Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. Um, why only the one part? Why only from the start to the end? Because that's our overall change in movement and a treasure map, right? So what we did was uh, a way to think about this, I'm gonna draw over this in red, is we did a movement that was from start to point A. We went from point A to point B, and then from point B to point C. 
if you now with vector math, it's saying add all these red arrows together. So add the magnitude and the amount that you move and also the direction that you move one right after one movement right after another when you get to the final place after you've added all of your arrows together the thing that we've got highlighted in purple is really what your overall total movement was yeah you did like your net change it's a difference between total change and net change like um <laughs> Like, I don't know how much, you know, like economics wise, like total income versus net income. Oh. Total income would be like, oh, I made like $5,000, but I spent $4,000 to make that 5000 So overall, I really only made $1,000. So the 5000 is your total income, whereas your $1,000 is your net income. Yeah. So the net change is what is here in green. And we use that same kind of thought process when we do dipole moments for an overall molecule. We take the um, individual bond dipoles that we've got, like number one here, um, number one here, and number two here. We go over, we can say, well, we start from here. We started at the uh, blue dot, we went up, and then we went over just by adding the arrows together, and we have this net change of the purple arrow from starting to end. Okay. So that's overall how we calculate a molecular dipole moment. The overall dipole moment on our um, ethyl methyl ester will be less than the overall dipole moment on our acetone. The carbon, the carbon oxygen double bond will allow um, that oxygen to pull more of the electron density towards it. So if we were to draw an electrostatic potential map here, we would find we're going to have a stronger partial negative and a slight partial positive and a partial positive here on the carbon for this molecule versus a slight partial positive um, on the two carbons surrounding the oxygen in our methyl ethyl methyl ester. So what was that? You just cut out. Oh, sorry. The at the end of the day, we're going to have a stronger uh, difference in, um, we're going to have the electrons in our acetone be around the oxygen more, making the acetone be a more polar molecule than the ethyl methyl ester, the top one will be. All right. So both of them will be polar molecules but the acetone will be a more polar molecule. If it is a more polar molecule, it will want to interact with other acetone molecules stronger. Because so the stronger the polarity, the more polar it is, the more polar it is, the stronger the interaction between molecules will be. That's because of the double bond on the oxygen? Largely because of the double bond on the oxygen and the shape of the molecule overall. Okay. Yeah. Yep. By having that double bond there, by having the oxygen just kind of be in a uh, electron sink, it's going to be pretty electronegative, and it's going to be pulling in just the one direction versus um, the ester there at the top. Um, that ester at the top has to pull electrons from two different carbons, it won't have as strong of an overall dipole moment. Okay. So, so since our acetone is our most polar molecule, 
it should have the highest boiling point of these three. More polar, stronger the the higher the boiling point should be. Methylpropane, the thing on the far left, isn't polar at all, so it's only got dispersion forces. So it's only it's, so it's going to be pretty weak overall. So we're going to go weak because just London dispersion, then methyl ester because. It's not as polar as acetone, and then acetone because it's the most polar of the two polar molecules. So to really answer a question like this, you have to figure out what are the intermolecular forces that exist between the molecules. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think so. It might just require some practice. Um, it's going to require practice identifying intermolecular forces. Full show. Sure.